Rogue Warrior is one of those bad games that rather than flying under the radar and being lost to obscurity, ended up becoming the subject of ceaseless public mockery. And just like Ride to Hell or Duke Nukem Forever, other pilloried titles contemporary with Rogue Warrior that found themselves in the gaming stocks, the level of derision it receives is perhaps a bit hyperbolic. Now, that's not to say this video is going to be some full-throated defense of Rebellion and Bethesda's foul-mouthed Cold War adventure, but I'll be honest, this one is a bit of a guilty pleasure for me. That's because Rogue Warrior is an exemplary, so bad it's good kind of game. Even though it's just absolutely stacked with issues and feels like it was put together with all the care of a Big Mac made at 3am coming from the worst McDonald's in town, it's just as shamefully satisfying as that late night grease bomb when you go in knowing what to expect. Speaking of knowing what to expect, if there's any place to start when it comes to playing through the adventures of Demo Dick Marcinko in this day and age, it's figuring out how to get the damn thing running in the first place. Shoddy fucking commie engineering. Put simply, this thing was not made with modern day Windows 11 in mind. It was barely made with any PC in mind, because this port is dreadful, even by the standards of 2009. It stutters constantly, is riddled with screen tearing, has basically zero graphics options for you to work with, it doesn't even have subtitles, and on a multi-monitor setup, it won't lock your mouse to one display, so you end up constantly minimizing the window, which for me, caused it to crash each and every time. Thankfully, I'm not the first person who has decided to blow an afternoon with this game in recent years, and as a result, there are several Steam guides and discussion threads up that'll help you get it running, along with a surprisingly solid page on the PC Gaming Wiki to further fine-tune it. It's a simple enough set of fixes overall, nothing more than dropping in a couple of DLLs, adjusting some Nvidia settings manually, and setting up DG Voodoo 2 to properly smooth out some of the edges and make the window capture your mouse cursor. That said, despite DG Voodoo 2 being all but idiot proof, I always have trouble with it for some reason, so I, I just ended up using the caveman workaround of disabling my other monitors while I played. This gave me a stable experience at a proper resolution, and playing it looked completely fine, though it did end up borking my footage a bit, turning it upside down and making all the stealth kills look super dark. I have absolutely no idea why I did this to my footage, and I have zero inclination to re-record it, so fair warning if some of the kills here look off. And do know that with the fixes I've linked, it does look just fine playing it live if you do end up deciding to dive into this game yourself. As for why there are so many technical problems with this game, well, you can likely thank Rebellion using their proprietary Asura engine, a piece of tech they actually still use today and have used for pretty much everything major they've developed since almost the turn of the millennium. While it does the job well enough, it's never been an especially amazing engine looking at best on par with whatever the current version of Unreal is, often with rougher edges. <laughs> That's not to say it can't look good, and when they build around it properly, like with the Sniper Elite series, where it's used to really impressively model mostly accurate ballistics, it's amazing. But at the end of the day, the biggest selling point for Asura is that Rebellion owns it, and as such, don't need to pay for licensing costs on it. Of course, in a situation like this, where the game is published by another company, one who has all but disavowed it and certainly isn't going to be spending money or time on patches, that tech, as it exists in Rogue Warrior, was just left to rot, and was never going to work right on anything a couple of years past launch, and again, barely at launch. But that won't stop the industrious dumpster rats that are the PC gaming community. Collectively, we can get anything running again. And as such, we've got our fixes installed, and we can get started. Welcome to beautiful North Korea. 
We begin by fading in on our hero, Richard Demodic Marcenko, riding a helicopter along with a couple of his most trusted squad mates. They're prepping to get dropped into North Korea to meet up with a mole who has info on a munitions factory that's producing a whole new breed of missiles. Now, for context, despite how unbelievable the character of Demo Dick is in this game and all the crazy shit you're about to see him do, Richard Marcenko was a real human being, a decorated military veteran who led the secretive SEAL Team 6 and was a key figure in a bunch of American espionage shit during the 80s and 90s. His military service came to an inauspicious end, though, when he was charged with conspiracy, conflict of interest, and lying to the government, as a result of a kickback he received due to a markup in the price of hand grenades a company he established was selling to the government. He was sentenced to 21 months in federal prison and a $10,000 fine as a result, and once he served his time and was released, he began writing the titular Rogue Warrior series of novels, the first being an autobiography and the subsequent books being grander and more exaggerated fictional stories that largely came from his ghostwriter. He also co-authored a three-book series with that same writer on leadership, management, team building, and, you know, all that kind of shit for executives. As someone whose real job has them reading those kinds of books and knowing how they often sound, that does track with the demo dick we get to know with this game, oddly enough. After that, he went on to a career of private security consulting, talk radio, lending his knowledge and expertise to the show 24, and various other side ventures, including a Las Vegas-based tequila brand called Fubar, which is apparently pretty good going off the reviews I can find for it. He passed away just a couple of years ago at the age of 81, after having lived a very full life, albeit one full of controversy, with his exploits being both lauded and reviled to this day. It's hard to know how he felt about this game being a part of his legacy, though some of the stories I've heard from development is that he really enjoyed a lot of the character in it, for lack of a better term, but at the end of the day, given that there is an actual human being behind the memes in this game and just all of this nonsense, it felt only right to add some nuance here and give his history. Anyways back to the chopper ride. Once Dick finishes his monologue about what we're even doing here, we land and he and his team get into a scuffle with some nearby KPA soldiers. Then, with not even a full minute of screen time between them, Dick's two buddies immediately get murked by some asshole with the martyrdom perk and don't even whimper as they die. Dick reports this back to his CO, who tells him to abort the mission and says that it's too dangerous to go alone, but Dick is, of course, too much of a badass for that, and plows forward regardless. He doesn't elaborate on why, like saying how important he feels the mission is, or expressing remorse and wanting to avenge his dead friends. He just tells the Admiral, no, fuck off, and the game just moves on. And I would have liked to have seen them push that last point as well, because it's not like these are just some random grunts he had hanging around with him. His two buddies had detailed custom models and animations, which expressed at least some minimal degree of character in that opening sequence. To have them just eat it right out of the gate and have so little presence they don't even get voice actors is just bizarre. Maybe they were originally intended to be part of some scrapped co-op campaign, who, who knows, but the fact that they exist at all only to just be snuffed out is weird. Anyways, barreling forward, Dick now gets to start his stealthy murder spree through the shadowy, abandoned remains of some brutalist designed commie housing blocks, which is a perfect opportunity to get to grips with the gameplay. Now, Rogue Warrior is a first person shooter from the late 2000s. And I don't just say that as a broad Wikipedia esque statement of fact, I mean that intrinsically. For better or worse, Rogue Warrior has every trope from that era of shooters, just down to the way the game feels. It has the requisite two-weapon limit, regenerating health, fucky cover system, half-ass stealth, small-scale scripted stop-and-pop encounters. This game is 2009. 
That's not necessarily a bad thing either. As while it was a formula we were all sick of after not too long, going back to it now there is some satisfaction to be found. That broad rhythm of entering a room, having a hard time, then identifying threats, spawns, and cover points, restructuring your approach accordingly, and either getting through it this time by the skin of your teeth or dying and trying to do it again more efficiently, is still engaging, and it pushes you to get in sync and immersed with a game. Rogue Warrior is perhaps not the most polished example of this formula, breath coming, motherfuckers. but it has the fundamentals down and can be fun as a result. It doesn't hurt that it's ultimately not that punishing either, and they give you a lot of tools to make things easier, like a magic radar that shows you enemy alertness as well as position, and a silenced pistol with infinite ammo that easily headshots dudes at mid-range. Of course, those tools were added with the stealth system in mind, which, despite being half-assed like I said earlier, does add another semi-enjoyable layer to things. In fact, I would say that the game feels like it was designed chiefly for stealth. At least, at some point in development it probably was, as there are considerations made for it that make being sneaky weirdly enjoyable in a game that is as aggressive as Rogue Warrior tends to be. It's all still super limited, mind you. It's the bog standard stealth of the time, it just has you crouch walking everywhere, pausing only to hit contextual button prompts every now and again, to commit graphic violence. But it works! The enemies are dumb enough, and you have just enough context granted by that magic radar to make planning out your approach actually feel viable in most situations. And the melee stealth kills are punchy and over the top enough to be satisfying even if they do repeat quite a bit, especially by the end of the game. You do also see a marked difference in encounters where you manage to at least start with stealth, with them feeling more manageable than just going in guns blazing, even if that's where the situation almost always leads. It's the rare game that manages to make breaking stealth not feel like a failure, but rather a natural ramp up in the action. This means it is equally as satisfying to ghost a room and quietly clean everyone out as it is to drop in, firing from every barrel as you throw out expletives and explosives in equal measure, with there being a relatively smooth transition between those two states. Getting back to the events at hand though, Dick eventually clears his way through to the mole who has unfortunately already been made and is executed just as Dick busts through the door. Thankfully, in what will become an odd trend going forward, all of the highly sensitive, super damaging information that the mole was going to share with us has been documented by his captor, presumably in English as I don't get the sense Dick speaks Korean, and just left haphazardly on a nearby table in this dilapidated slum. Befuddling bounty of information in hand, Dick reports back to the Admiral that he's got the location for that munitions factory, along with those fancy new missiles, and is heading off to deal with the fuckers now. Just as he's leaving though, a fresh squad of grunts comes in through the door, so he chucks a grenade their way and blows the place to smithereens, giving the level a nice explosive finale, something else that will become a trend going forward. Happy fucking birthday, assholes. Arriving at the munitions factory and announcing his presence with all the class that he can afford, the great leader must have a tiny dick. Marcinko sets to work looking for the missiles, only to somehow deduce that some of them have already been shipped out. The Admiral says they'll try to figure out where the other missiles have gone on their side, with the brass now apparently on board with this whole plan, while Dick heads off to destroy the missiles remaining at the factory. Something you might have noticed by now is that you can actually see shit in this level, as we're out of the midnight confines of the commie blocks and into some fucking daylight. And honestly, with the massive added asterisk of for the time, it doesn't look half bad. It's certainly generic, of course, and the textures and modeling are nothing to write home about, but it does manage a semblance of composition here and there. And the levels do feel distinct from one another, being more than just a series of industrial complexes. You'll see it more as we go along, but there is a golden eye sort of vibe to the world of Rogue Warrior. Some of it is just the Cold War espionage theme to be sure, but there's also a confident simplicity and sense of place to the level design, which uses a similar variety of locations that work in the same way. Not that comparing this 14-year-old game to a 26-year-old one 
um, is paying it any massive compliment or anything, but it does show some level of proper design fundamentals being put on display. It also helps make up for some of the rougher edges, and there are a lot of them. I showed earlier how the Asura engine at the time was no better at ragdolls than UE3 was, and for a game with this many explosions, plot relevant explosions at that, uh, they all kind of look like shit. They're not the pizza sauce nightmare seen in the Mighty Number no. 9 trailer or anything, but they are very flat, and it's easy to see the animated JPEG layers that comprise the bigger cutscene explosions. Not that the in-game bangs are worth more buck either, with grenades throwing up only a small cloud of dust and a bit of flame not even worthy of the cheap, impulse buy fireworks you see at Giant Tiger as soon as it hits summer. Going back to cutscenes, something else you'll notice is just how robotic the movement in them often feels. It seems like they properly keyed up some custom animations in these scenes, but then also reused a bunch of other animations they already had rigged up for gameplay where they could, which just don't flow together all that well. Mixed with some dicey camera work, it gives the cutscenes a bit of a machinima sort of vibe. You just feel the strings on everything a bit too much. Speaking of strings and moving things in a positive direction, something that I feel is an unambiguous point in Rogue Warrior's favor is its soundtrack. The ending credits rap has of course become a meme at this point, and deservedly so, that shit is great, but honestly, the OST as a whole is really strong here. They understood what this game was and what era of media it was truly trying to evoke, leaning hard into a sense of 80s action movie cheese, with a really great use of synth, and wandering power chords that punctuate quiet moments. It's a score that's full of drive and intensity, but without undue bombast or pretension. These are not the overdone, swelling, self-serious themes that often typify the seventh generation of shooters, especially military ones where they would put on airs and pretend like all the shooty bang bang fun they're partaking in is dramatic and dire. Put simply, this OST is not trying to be Call of Duty. It's trying to be Commando. This is an OST that treats the game with respect, but is ultimately about letting the player and the game itself just joyously revel in the violent, irreverent, nonsensical mess it has laid out for us all to enjoy. To be honest, I spent a good while trying to figure out why this soundtrack was clicking for me as much as it was, and upon watching the credits, I figured it out. Our old friend, Ross Tregenza of Homefront the Revolution fame, was on the audio team. And I'm gonna guess he was the core composer here, though not for the infamous rap that's credited to Mark Lampert. And my reason for assuming he was a Lee when it comes to the soundtrack is specifically because there are a lot of shared elements between the scores for Rogue Warrior and the second Homefront, with a similar sense of forward momentum and clever synth flourishes being regularly bandied about. He just does subtle 80s action movie homage perfectly, it seems. So kudos to him on that, and to this score for easily being the best part of this game, even without the amazing rap, which I promise you, I'm capping this video off with. Go ahead, skip to the end, and enjoy it, and then come back. I, I won't judge you. Time code forward is in the description, just, just go. Ah, well. Now that we're all refreshed with the magic that is hearing Mickey Rourke cuss for about three minutes straight, Let's get back to the story. We left off with Dick continuing to scour the factory, looking for more missiles to slap C4 onto. After not too long though, the Admiral calls him up to let him know that their SAT team has spotted a shipment preparing to leave the nearby docks, which they suspect are the missing ICBMs. With his next port of call settled, Dick escapes the factory, right as his little surprise activates and blows the place sky high, with another massive shitty looking explosion giving us two for two in missions ending with layered fire and smoke dot gif. Miss me, motherfuckers. 
Arriving at the docks, Dick has two key goals here. To catch up with the missiles before they depart, and to find out just where the hell they're going. He makes his way through with what relative stealth he can muster, in between stabbing motherfuckers repeatedly in the groin, before eventually catching sight of the shipment. It turns out they're not going by boat, though, they're being sent by train and are just about to leave the station. This leads to a mad dash through the shipyard, taking on squads of North Korean soldiers and dock workers in a desperate bid to hop the train before it's too late. Which he does, because that's how levels play out in Rogue Warrior. Dick starts the level setting out to do a thing, and then he does it, with no real twists or major surprises along the way. Before we move on to the next chapter though, this sprint through the shipping containers is the perfect opportunity to talk some more about how this game actually plays. Like I said earlier, it's a pretty by-the-numbers military shooter for the time, but where those can be punishing when they want, stretching your reflexes to clear an encounter perfectly on the hardest difficulties, the Rogue Warrior is kind of a cakewalk. The game itself certainly doesn't think that's the case, the difficulty selection is about as try-hard and edgy as you might expect, but honestly, Elite Mode really isn't much of a challenge. Those overpowered stealth mechanics we've already discussed are a major factor there, but the biggest thing really is the AI. The enemies are just rock fucking stupid in this game, happily swapping cover at terrible times and staring blissfully at grenades lobbed directly at their feet. Sometimes they'll react properly, but only when it feels like the game has them in a position where it has already planned for them to do so. Ambushes, flanking, anything beyond just milling about behind cover, all seem to be nakedly prompted by environmental triggers. Dick crosses an invisible line, and suddenly their neurons fire up and they're competent for a few seconds. Now, that doesn't mean you won't die. On Elite difficulty, Dick is pretty much paper, enemies will lay down more fire, and there seems to be more of them around to shoot at you. All that really does is slow things down a bit and force you to engage at range more than you might like, which sucks because you'll miss out on some of those sweet melee kills, but honestly you'll be seeing those repeat ad nauseum by the end of the game anyways, so no big loss there. It also doesn't hurt that death in this game is pretty painless, and kind of enjoyable in a weird way. Checkpoints are super plentiful, and while I can't speak for how it performed at launch, with the grunt of a modern PC and running off an SSD, the time between death and respawn is pretty much instant. This means you're back in the fight before you've even registered the annoyance of dying. Hell, the only notice you might have is the fact that most of the time when you get hurt or fucking cark it, Mickey Rourke will grumble out another slew of obscenities, which does take the edge off of things. Fuck this goddamn shit. On that note, Rourke's overall delivery of the VO in this game was definitely something a lot of reviewers at the time panned, but frankly, his sleepy, angry grandpa take on the character totally works for me, especially in the context of gameplay. It means that hitting a wall on this game and dying repeatedly to some cheap grenade spam or unseen shotgunner actually ends up being kind of fun, because before you can say an expletive of your own, Dick has already groggily slurred one out for you. It's like the game is getting frustrated along with you, which for me at least makes it easier to laugh it all off and just headbutt my way past whatever crap section they've put together that's stalling my progress through this train wreck. And speaking of trains, we should probably get back to the story. What the fuck was I doing again? Oh yeah, fucking shit up. So you've probably picked up on the fact that every chapter so far has been named with a gruff military acronym, and that's the case for every level in this game. Snafu, Catten, Kiss, Fubar, these are self-explanatory, and even if you're not the kind of CSGO lobby gremlin that might already have these in your head, a cursory Google search will let you know what they mean. That is, of course, with one exception. This level's title, PFDL. I have spent at least two solid hours combing through Google search results trying to find an answer for just what in God's name this acronym could possibly stand for. The only official acronyms I could find were Policy Framework Definition Language and Plutonium Fuel Development Laboratory. That first one definitely isn't it, and while the second seems like it could be potentially plausible, this whole level just takes place on a bridge. So. That's not it either. Getting away from official designations and moving into slang, I could find only one extremely suspect option. Polk Farm 
on the down low. A phrase I have never heard before, has only a single entry on the Urban Dictionary, and that entry was submitted a year after this game was made. The definition does fit, as it's about having a party where some gangsta shit is going on and you don't want people to know, apparently. But it's so esoteric and obscure that I can't for the life of me think that's what they were going for. So yeah, I have no idea what PFDL means still. I'm begging you, if you know what the fuck this acronym is supposed to refer to, please put it down in the comments, because not knowing tortures me to this day and will continue to keep me up at night. <sighs> what the fuck are we doing? Right, riding a train. So, in the last level, Dick hopped on the roof of this train that's carrying the missiles, and apparently that's where he has stayed the whole time it's been in transit, now being stopped at the Soviet border. He did that journey in a t-shirt in November, and a joke is naturally made about it being so cold as to freeze the nuts off a polar bear. I was going to make a joke about how unrealistic making this trip would be, but honestly, after doing some research, I will give the game some credit and say that it is eminently doable. The distance between Ungi, North Korea and the Kasan district border in Russia is roughly 22 kilometers as the crow flies, and we'll add an extra 3 kilometers to that to account for the track likely not being a straight line. And with the average speed of a full freight train being about 30 to 50 kilometers per hour, that means Dick's icebox adventure could be as short as 20 to 25 minutes. Outside temperatures would be equivalent to what you'd get in the northeast here in North America, and November generally isn't too cold as winter is still settling in. While the wind chill would make things very unpleasant, it would likely be survivable, especially if Dick's got winter warfare experience, the same as every Canadian dad who's ever taken out the garbage in minus 40 wearing an open jacket and sneakers, who then comes back at the house and says, eh, it's not too bad out there. All of this is to say that while the story here is over the top and ridiculous, there is at least some grounding in reality, even if it's not readily apparent. Man, I got off track again, didn't I? Where are we? Russian border, right. So, back to the story. Dick hops off the train so we can take this opportunity to destroy the missiles, as well as try to figure out where they were headed. Naturally, he does this in the most subtle way possible, by blowing up the entire bridge and jumping off at the last minute. He then just kind of apparates within the border complex on the other side of the river and works his way up through the building as he tries to escape all the destruction his actions have caused. Of course, he then stumbles on to yet more highly classified information that has been left haphazardly on another random table. This is how he learns that the missile program is Soviet, not Korean. The USSR just had North Korea build the missiles for them so as to not attract any undue attention from the West. He also learns that their final destination was an old palace nearby, where the Soviets are hiding a missile base, and gets ready to go take the fuckers down. This is despite the Admiral yelling in his ear, begging him not to make the Cold War turn hot, and threatening him with a court-martial. Dick, of course, does not give the slightest of shits and takes off. The Soviet fucking Union can fondle my hairy nuts. I mentioned earlier that this game kind of reminds me of Goldeneye, and here at the palace is where I feel like that really shines through, as it's where the game seems to be at its most Soviet. This is also where you'll find the last gun in this game's arsenal of weapons, the extremely rare and coveted Tokarev pistol. Now, don't let the fact that it's the same as the regular pistol, just not silence and maybe doing slightly more damage, fool you. This is some priceless shit that certainly isn't one of the most common guns you'd find in the USSR and honestly probably the entire world at the time. After all, they didn't make well over a million of these things during their reign, and of course the North Koreans didn't have their own cheap copied version that they would be slapping into the hands of every single conscript to this very goddamn day. So it makes sense that this extremely basic blowback pistol would only show up now, in the seat of Soviet opulence, where its magnificence could be truly appreciated and treasured. Okay, I'm done taking the piss. I just find it really weird that of all the guns for them to hold back, it's the fucking Tokarev. Especially because while it had been supplanted in the USSR at this point by the Makarov, these things, or rather their KPA copy, the Type 68, would have been more common than dirt in North Korea at the time, and honestly still likely would be today. 
Presumably they did it for balance reasons, but it does stick out to anyone with a rudimentary knowledge of historical Soviet firearms. And if you have more than a rudimentary knowledge of firearms of that era, this game is packed to the brim with weird little inaccuracies and anachronisms just like that one. Guns that weren't invented yet, guns that are too old, animations that are clearly reused and don't quite fit right with every gun they're rigged to. It's a thing. That said, even as a proud gun pedant, I kinda don't actually care in this case, as it all feels... excusable. Their choice of firearms is clearly focused on providing distinct silhouettes and having very useful gameplay roles across the entire weapon set, rather than trying to slavishly stay within historical lines, which I can respect. This game also looks like it had pretty much no budget, so cutting corners and reusing some animations or using guns that can share some modeling is totally understandable. Helping further is the fact that they don't dwell on their arsenal. There is no upgrade system or in-game wiki or anything like that to call attention to where they've fudged things and gotten it all wrong, which does make those choices easier to ignore and lets me just focus on having fun with these guns. Honestly, the most offensive thing to me as far as Rogue Warrior's firearm choices are concerned is that Dick apparently likes the MP5 enough to start every mission with it, but never gives it the good old-fashioned HK slap. That's the best part of using an MP5! Okay, time to put my inner gun nerd away for the day and get back to the story. This level consists of Dick sneaking his way through the palace, clearing hedgerows and blockades made of very expensive furniture, before eventually passing through the library and into the basement where the missile control center is located. After clearing it out, he learns that these missiles he's been tracking are actually part of an ICBM defense system, meant to shoot American nukes out of the sky before they can impact, allowing the Reds first strike capability and taking mutually assured destruction off the table. Basically, it is a fictional Soviet equivalent to Ronald Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative, or as it was mockingly called at the time, the Star Wars program. Which, I'll be honest, I didn't realize wasn't its true name until researching for this video. Apparently, that term was coined by the Washington Post, and came from a soundbite they got from Ted Kennedy back in the day, who panned the whole SDI proposal as reckless Star Wars schemes, unintentionally giving it a way better name. History. It's a hell of a thing. Anyways, as you can imagine, the Russians getting this kind of system online first is a big deal, and the Admiral expresses an appropriate amount of distress at this revelation. Once again, he pleads with Dick to abort the goddamn mission so they can get a full team out there to handle things, rather than have Dick continue to run amok and leave the freezer door open on the Cold War. Naturally, Dick responds with a good old shant, and proceeds to use his mastery of both Cyrillic and whatever the Soviet equivalent of DOS is, in order to retarget the missiles to hit this very facility and blow it to kingdom come, escaping just in time using a convenient nearby elevator and making this the third level to end with an explosion. Uh, looks like the douchebag convention's in town. From here on, things move at a lightning clip, as the story has nothing even resembling a twist left to offer, and we stick firmly to that level framework of Dick saying he's going to do a thing, and then doing it. This is why I keep going on rants about nonsense, there's fuck all else for me to work with in this story. In this particular episode, Dick now needs to find out where the rest of the missiles have been sent, destroy any that are still left here in the palace bunker, and get out of dodge. And of course he does just that, by planting yet more C4 on a few waiting missiles before escaping via the motor pool and heading off to the nearby dam. Why is he heading for the dam? Well, because it's powering the subpen that's housing the nuclear submarine onto which the remaining missiles have been loaded. How does he know this heretofore unmentioned submarine has the remaining missiles, and that the subpen is being powered by a dam? For the longest time, I had no idea, as there's no scene in this mission where he says he's learned these things. Going back over the footage with a fine tooth comb, I realized that his objective to learn where the missiles are going disappears after pressing a single button on this one specific terminal, an action he does not comment upon or report back to HQ. All that button seems to do in the moment is open a door and trigger more combat. So I assumed that unlocking the door was the purpose of that button. 
but apparently the single beep it emits when Dick just brushes against it was enough to conveniently let him in on the entire rest of the script. I got bullets for every one of those motherfuckers. Moving on to the dam, you already know what we're going to do here. Dick is going to wander around some more linear concrete corridors. He's going to place the same C4 model using the same animation, but this time on dam turbines instead of a missile, and then watch the place blow up in another awful looking explosion, our fourth level to end with one, as he then repels down the side of the dam. This level was at least somewhat varied visually. You get some nice bits out in the snow, which further evokes more of those golden eye vibes with the setting alone. But just like the rest of this game, there's absolutely nothing to any of it. It's funny, despite this game ostensibly being based off a whole series of books, this is some of the scantest and most efficient writing for a plot I've ever seen. It's got the pacing of an artillery strike. I swear to god, I have read microwave instruction manuals that have had more depth and nuance than the proceedings of this fucking game. It makes up for a lot of that with just sheer, blunt character, with Dick's assorted barks and rants being yeah, epics yeah, out of themselves, yeah, but man, is it just not enough to give this game anything resembling substance. President Reagan sends his regards. Having dealt with the dam, Dick heads to the subpen so he can disable the missiles and retrieve the guidance system from the submarine. Naturally, despite going to all of that effort to shut down the power, it comes back on within five minutes of Dick beginning his assault, because backup batteries would be a thing at highly sensitive and important military installations. That being said, the lights being back on doesn't seem to actually do anything to slow your advance, and before long you're doing the same C4 two-step again with the remaining warheads. After that, Dick grabs the guidance chip from the submarine, which is helpfully located at an open hatch on the sail, which is apparently what that tower bit is called, before diving off into the water before the whole place explodes. Happy about keeping his streak of exploded facilities alive, Dick is then picked up by a boat full of Navy SEALs sent to support him, but having missed out on all the fun. Acting like an actual human being, the leader of this squad gives Dick his condolences for the buddies he lost way back at the start of the game, whom you'd be forgiving for failing to remember ever existed in the first place. Dick responds with his usual gruff nonchalance, saving those mental scars for later so as to not let this story even try to be poignant for a second. We then cut to the greatest credit sequence ever made, the aforementioned rap number, which as far as I'm concerned is enough to justify this game's entire production. Well, presumably Dick is then hauled off to a court-martial on charges of gross insubordination, considering how he basically spent the entire campaign cussing his way up the chain of command and ignoring all of their instructions. Rock and roll, motherfuckers, rock and roll. And with that, we finish off Rogue Warrior's campaign, which is really all there is to it, as the multiplayer is an extremely anemic offering featuring just deathmatch and TDM. Naturally, the servers are dead and dirt at this point, and according to Steam charts, they weren't much better at launch. But before we wrap things up, I do want to go into the development history of this game just a bit, because there is an interesting story behind it. I won't go into too much detail as other people have covered this game plenty well before me, but I will cover the broad strokes. This story begins with the Bethesda of the late aughts, who while they had been around since the 80s, were riding especially high at this point on the popularity of Morrowind and then the crazy breakout success of Oblivion. This led to the company expanding into publishing, and they started picking up things to bolster their catalog, most notably Fallout. But in addition to grabbing the rights to everyone's favorite retro-futuristic reminder that California is a nightmare hellscape, they also hoovered up a number of other projects and IPs, one of which was the game rights to the Rogue Warrior series of novels. One can only imagine that they saw the piles of money that Ubisoft was rolling in thanks to Tom Clancy, and wanted to break off a piece of that lucrative military thriller action for themselves. Initially announced in 2006 under the moniker Rogue Warrior Black Razor, the game was at that point being developed by Zombie Studios, a legacy developer probably best known for the original Spec Ops games back in the day. Their take on the game was more multiplayer focused, and it featured a groundbreaking map system, where teams would select what they wanted their territory to look like, and then the battlefield would be procedurally generated based on both teams' decisions. This version of the game was also said to have lent in a more serious direction, going for a drier, true-to-life special forces story, rather than, well, you know. 
I'm going to fuck your mother in the ass, and then I'm going to chop her fucking head off, okay? Bethesda was supposedly unhappy with the direction of where the game was going at this point, scrapped it, and brought in Rebellion to rebuild it from the ground up, which gave us the version we have today titled simply Rogue Warrior. Rebellion, of course, has a very long development history of their own with some genuine classics under their belt, but it's worth noting that Rogue Warrior was not made by their main development team, but rather a side studio in Derby. This studio, which Rebellion purchased only a few years earlier, also in 2006, was formerly Core Design, the original creators of Tomb Raider, who had fallen on hard times after the utter nightmare that was Tomb Raider Angel of Darkness. A good chunk of that team had already split off to form Circle Studio back in 2003, and the remainder were now turned into Rebellion Derby. Under this name, they made two games, Rogue Warrior of course, and before that, Shell Shock 2 Blood Trails, which is also just completely dreadful. Between those two titles, they never managed a Metacritic score above 40, and sadly they were shut down not long after Rogue Warrior was squeezed out onto store shelves when the lease ran up on their office space. They made their mark though, as in their honor not long after the studio's closure, the town of Derby christened a nearby road to Lara Croft Way. Which is sweet, but likely of little solace to those former devs now looking for work due to the studio not being able to even make rent. So that's the sad fate of Core Design slash Rebellion Derby, but what happened to everybody else in this story? Well, Bethesda and Rebellion proper are both still doing fine, of course, so there's no need for me to go into detail there. Zombie Studios, on the other hand, unfortunately went defunct in 2015 after over 20 years in business. But they did at least get to put that cool procedural multiplayer map idea to the test with a game called Special Forces Team X. A digital-only, team-based shooter published by Atari, it had a cool look, but failed to make much of an impact due to technical issues and the oversaturation of similar military multiplayer shooters at the time. But what about Circle Studios? That core design offshoot that escaped Rebellion Derby's fate of making mediocre military shooters only to then be shut down. What happened to them? Well, they made a mediocre military shooter, and then got shut down. The only actual game that Circle Studios ever made was the 2005 third-person shooter Without Warning, aka the 24 we have at home. Published by Capcom, of all people, this game is a typical junky console shooter of the era, with janky lock-on shooting, an absolutely nauseating camera, and levels that are all just big rooms that you plow through over and over again. Its core gimmick is that you're swapping between characters each level, and the story is taking place in parallel between them, which is admittedly kind of neat, but again just a shallow imitation of 24. The same goes for the plot, which is that a bunch of terrorists, just shy of being ripped out of Postal 2, assault a chemical plant with the intention to blow it up, and then your various soldier mans and a security guard do everything they can to stop them and save hostages along the way. It's schlocky, and it's dumb, and it feels like foreigners trying to imitate what they thought American cultural attitudes were at the time, and blindly painting with the absolute broadest of brushes. Honestly, it's probably worthy of its own episode here at some point, if I didn't absolutely despise playing it. But then again, that's never stopped me before. Sadly, after Without Warning understandably failed to light the world on fire, Circle Studio shut down in 2007 with the only other things to their name being a bunch of interactive DVD quiz games. The sort of things made only to rot on a shelf at Walmart. That's right, nighty night, you sweet piece of shit. Getting back to Rogue Warrior, though, as incredibly flawed as it is, I honestly can't bring myself to hate this game. Yeah, it's bereft of content. The campaign is only two to three hours long at best, and that's playing on the highest difficulty. But there's just enough fun to be had to make that two to three hours worthwhile. Once you've gone to the trouble of actually getting it working properly, the gameplay is serviceable. Visually, it looks just shy of adequate, the soundtrack is awesome, and the writing, though not the story, really does elevate it, for lack of a better word. The constant flow of expletives and obscenities is weirdly soothing and enjoyable, and it's not just the audacity of it, but the pace. There is a very measured way that Mickey Rourke spouts things out that makes them stick for some odd, fun reason, and lets me forgive a lot of this game's failings in the moment. 
Once this video goes live, I will happily forget every beat that happened in this game's story. All three of them. But I will forever have engraved in my mind palace the flowing, eternal words, Goddamn cock breath, call me motherfuckers. Goddamn cock breath, call me motherfuckers. There's simply something about the rhythmic way that line is delivered, and this goes for most of the profane rambling in this game, that just kind of makes this whole broken ramshackle experience work and puts a smile on my face. Was it ever worth the full $60 it launched at? Oh god no, not for a fucking second. Is it worth six leaf bucks going as low as a buck and a half on sale now and giving up a few hours to play through it? Absolutely. It is the video game equivalent of lazing on the couch on a Sunday afternoon, languidly flipping through the channels, desperately trying to find something to occupy yourself with, only to land on some long forgotten movie on cable that you skipped in theaters years ago but have always been morbidly curious about. And then somehow finding yourself happily watching through the whole thing while understanding exactly why it was left to be forgotten. Go into it with that basement level of expectation and you'll likely come out satisfied just like with that terrible Sunday movie and more importantly with that amazing ending credits wrap stuck in your head. Speaking of that rap, I promise I'll let you all enjoy that again in a second. But I do need to cover some business here first. I know this was not the video that many of you were expecting. Alpha Protocol was next on my list, but life got in the way and I ended up taking a couple of months off from video stuff. Rather than try to get back to the massive effort that is reviewing a full RPG and end up not putting out a video till like 2024, especially as I'd been running into some tech issues that forced me to upgrade and rejigger my entire audio setup, I figured I'd take on something far simpler first, just to get myself back up and running. I do still want to do an Alpha Protocol video at some point, but I think it's going to become a white whale of sorts for me, and I'm going to work on some other smaller games and projects in the meantime to hopefully try and get at least a couple more videos out this year. If you liked this video, or really any of the other videos I've made on this channel, I'd certainly appreciate it if you could go hit some of those buttons down there. Whichever ones feel right. Seeing people watch and enjoy the content I've made is what spurs me on to make more, so having evidence I'm not just pitching this stuff out into the void does help. I'll leave it at that though, no one likes being sold to at the end of a video, and I know what you're really here for if you're still sticking around at this point. So as always, have a good one, and let's bring the noise and enjoy Mickey Rourke doing his finest work. Fucking ninja style. I'm gonna bring it to him. I'm gonna show him what time it is. Good spot to bring the noise. Ah! You morons will love Hope you assholes like fireworks. Ooh! Fucking commies keep getting in my way. No surprise, motherfuckers. Happy fucking birthday. That's right, nighty now, you sweet piece of shit. Enjoy the ride, cocksucker. Have a nice trip. Boom time, baby. Trick or treat. Looks like a party, come on. I got places to go and people to meet. Assholes are everywhere. Fuckers are out in force. Hi ho, hi ho, this fucker's gonna blow. Anytime, anywhere, any place. Take names. Who's the hardest motherfuckers around, huh? Ah. Rock and roll, motherfuckers, rock and roll.
What the fuck was I doing again? Yeah, fucking shit up. Bring it to 